All right. Hi, Netta. Hi, Lima. Thank you so much for joining me here today on Vonvo.com. Uh, today's date is uh, April 20th, 2013, and we're here to discuss the uh, humanitarian efforts inside of Syria. Uh, just before we get started, I want to go over two quick things. Right now, this conversation is being recorded. And after the recording is completed, we'll be uploading this video to our YouTube channel on the internet. Is that okay with both of you? Of course. Yeah. All right, great. And then uh, on top of that, here at Vonvo, we're all about our discussions uh, staying both civil and valuable. Um, we don't want there to be any personal attacks against one another, uh, although you guys are sisters, so that shouldn't be, well, that might be an issue. Um, and uh, anyone else who were to join the chat room, um, is that okay with both of you? All right, yeah. great. Um, so just to ease our way into things, um, for everyone who's inside the chat room right now and watches this video later on, um, would you each mind just giving a quick background of yourself? Um, Netta, you could go first, and then Lima, and why you're so passionate about this subject. Sure. Um, my name is Netta Safadi. Um, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in health science uh, just last year. Um, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Netta, do you hear me? I am better. Hey, Netta, are you there? I see you're okay. Netta, do you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's you Lemma's turn. Okay, go ahead. You, you cracked up a bit, but go ahead, Lima. Okay, um, so, um, hi, my name is Lima Safadi, and I'm uh, currently a sophomore in college at Benedictine University. Um, I'd like to major in um, psychology, and I'm currently a Syrian activist involved in, in many events that go on for Syria, as well as I talk on, uh, I'm involved, basically. All right, great. Um, and one second, I think we have uh, Malak loading our video. Hey, Malak, are you there? Yep, I'm here. All right, great. Yes, you're you're just in time. Um, Hi, everybody. Hi, how are you? Hi. So, Malak, we were just um doing some quick introductions for anyone who's watching this video. Um, would you mind just giving a quick background of yourself um, and why you're so passionate about this topic? And then, uh, you know, you guys will, you know, go over the different items you wanted to speak about. So my name is Malak Shapoon. Um, I have been on Vonvo before. Um, I work with Shams Network, uh, mainly doing uh, translations about what's going on in Syria, uh, translating videos and news reports and things like that. Um, and I was also recently, I had the opportunity to go on a trip organized by the Syrian American Council uh, for young people, and they went over into Turkey and saw the refugee camps and the situation there. Um, I hesitate to call myself an activist. I think the people on the ground there, they're, they're the true activists, but uh, it, I, my main interest in the Syrian cause right now is the humanitarian uh, side of everything that's going on. Great. Um, so, you know, that's obviously, uh, that was kind of the, the subject we came up with um, to, to speak on. Um, so, <clears throat> what I guess I would ask first is, um, would you each mind giving uh, a quick background? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we, and you guys can take the discussion wherever you'd like from here, but Netta, would you mind talking about um, either the lack of or the abundance of humanitarian aid uh, that's going into Syria, and you guys can sort of take the discussion uh, where we want uh, from there? Do you want me to talk just briefly, because I, I can go more in depth, or do you just want me to give a vague yeah, maybe just like a right yeah, maybe just like a, a good overall background on it, and then we'll start to drill down on specific you know aspects of it. Okay, so my topic is specifically aimed at the medical relief and you know the crisis on medical basis. Um, unfortunately, we um, are a little scarce. You know, as much as we're as much as a lot of countries are stepping in to provide, we're serving a whole country and we're lacking medical equipment, medications, you know, resources. So I, I, I'm speaking about specific hospitals, private, private sectors, 
field hospitals that organizations are, you know, providing in Syria and many other aspects that can help and make a difference to serve civilians well. Great. And uh, Lima or Malak, do you want to add anything on top of that? Lima, you could go first. Topic is specifically about um, about resources, uh, humanitarian rights, uh, lacks of resources. But before I begin, I'd like to specifically um, mention that, um, uh, like with further research and you know reading articles, newspapers, blogs, and uh, magazines, I've realized that um, or I've seen that many authors or writers put civil war. What's going on in Syria is not a civil war, and the dictionary definition of a civil war is actually a war between citizens of the same country. This is not a, a war between uh, citizens of the same country. It's war between civilians that want want to want to get rid of the Assad regime and then or Assad regime. And then we have the we have the um, Assad Assad regime uh, counteracting them by with violence. So this is actually called a massacre. And we had a massacre that occurred 32 years ago in 1981 in Hema. And it was, it was a massacre, and it wiped, the city was wiped out. So now history is repeating itself once again, and we're having another massacre. So I want to make things straight that this is not a civil war that's occurring. It's a massacre. And um, concerning my topic, I basically wanted to touch base upon that um, Syria has for resources wise, refugee camps have been lacking just basic necessities of resources like like plumbing uh, plumbing systems, um, sanitary water, as well as uh, adequate amount of foods. And right now, they're lacking all of that because there is no money and not enough aid going into Syria. Right. And Malak, any you know, obviously, uh, you ladies can feel free to have an open discussion. So. Uh, Malak, anything you want to add on top of that? And, um, you know, she brought up the refugee camps. You can feel free to speak about whatever you'd like. Okay. Um, so to give a little bit of an overview uh, on on the humanitarian situation overall, I mean, uh, I think one of the things that I'm really passionate about is, is education and the lack of education for children at this point. But just to give a little bit of background, um, Syria's population has been estimated in the last few years between 20 million and 25 million people. Um, latest UN numbers are saying that uh, the and the refugees have reached 1.4 million people almost. Um, and in the last six, only 400,000 people have had to leave Syria. And these refugees are going to Jordan, they're going to Turkey, uh, they're going to uh, uh, Jordan, Turkey, even Iraq. And Iraq, uh, obviously, the situation is, is also difficult for them there. So these uh, people are leaving Syria, going into other countries where the situation is, is quite difficult. And so we mentioned refugee camps. So almost 1.4 million people are registered as refugees, and they forecast, and they said that by the end of this year, if the conflict doesn't end, there, that number may be up to 3.5 million Syrians. And then that's aside from the Syrians who are inside of Syria and displaced there. So there are some people who leave their homes, and they're called the internally displaced. They leave their homes because of the shelling on the area or because of the attacks on the area, and they go somewhere else inside of Syria. And so if that number reaches 3.5 million, and we have about 1.4 million already outside. That's quite a large number for a population that was only 20 to 25 million to begin with. Um, so if you're, if you're thinking about these numbers, it's kind of uh, mind-boggling. You know, where are all of these people going? How are their needs being taken care of? Um, and starting as, as uh, Neda and Lemus, just from their, uh, you know, basic necessities and then medical necessities, and then you have these kids who are out of school, and some of which who have been out of school for two years. So that's the situation in numbers, um, and those are also estimates in many cases because not every refugee registers. Um, and inside, it's almost 
impossible to get an account, an accurate count of how many people have had to leave their homes. So it's 0.5 million a lot of people out of 20 to 25. Great. Uh, and Netta or Lima, do you guys want to uh, hit up, <coughs> you know, add anything on top of what Malak just said? Uh, yes, I do want to. Uh, in terms of the refugee camps, uh, yes, there are some uh, specific locations across the Middle East that are stepping in. And specifically, Turkey has done a great job, and we'd like to thank them for all their support and help. Uh, they're actually providing, in terms of Malacca's uh, topic, they're doing a great job in providing a promised education for kids that have lost education for about approximately two years, since March of 2011. So they're doing a great job in that um, uh, aspect, as well as they're providing medical equipment and providing resources that are needed to, to, to heal civilians that are injured, that need amputated feet, surgical procedures, all that stuff, etc. Jordan, there are a few refugee camps there, but it wasn't very successful like Turkey. Um, the reason why is because what was happening is the funding was coming from Qatar, and unfortunately, the funding was not being distributed the correct way from Jordanian to the refugee camps in Syria, to the Syrians. So fortunately, we were at loss, and it wasn't very successful. But if you want to talk about Turkey compared to Jordan, Turkey is at much as a much successful rate and is doing a great job to the refugees. Also, I just want to add on, um, you know, in terms of the government, the government of Syria is not helping, of course, at all, and it's making um, much worse conditions. Um, it's causing a chaotic condition in Syria. But to add on, the government in America, or the international government, hasn't stepped in at all whatsoever to help. Um, if you guys recall the Robert Ford, uh, they said that he would take a stance and provide aid for 12 million in August and 12th to help Syria and the refugees in order to provide them with any need and there was no effect no action took place and we're still waiting unfortunately no one's going to step in because there's no benefit in Syria for them to to you know there's no oil there's nothing that they find benefit in uh, in order to help Syria so they're just watching and uh, watching these you know numbers arise these deaths arise every single day I'm like going with what Nita said actually. Um, before the war began in Syria, Syria, Syria's, uh, um, real quick. So before the war began in Syria, uh, Syria's economy was based on agriculture, oil, industry, and especially tourism. Now they have had um, economic sanctions, so basically. They're restricting trade with uh, the Arab League um, in, in countries that we never thought they would actually um, trade with, like Australia. No one really knew that. We have Canada, we have the European Union, we have Japan, and um, Turkey especially, and, and the United States. And then now, once the, the massacre occurred, we don't have that occurring uh, any anymore. So, so thus, this has resulted in uh, a lack of amount of assistance and resources to these, to these camps, and uh, each single day, um, based uh, research statistically uh, proven that 8,000 refugees every single day come into the um, refugee camps. So it keeps on increasing every single day by thousands. We're not talking about hundreds, we're talking about thousands. So we can imagine. So we need a lot of aid into Syria, and most of these camps are women and children, so even more aid. Um, men are usually have been usually detained or, or killed or tortured to death, or either or either are fighting um, as Free Syrian Army, and so many hardships are being faced. And I'd like to add something. Um, many of the areas that have been most hardly hit by the regime are actually very areas of Syria to begin with. And so you have a population, for example, the uh, Palestinian, uh, you have moved Palestinian refugee camp, uh, the Palestinian refugee camps, um, some of which are in the Daraa province, some of which are in the Damascus province. Um, those areas have been particularly hard hit by the, the regime. So you have a population that's already refugees, and they're also having to leave, uh, leave their, their home, leave what little they have. Um, and if you want to talk about also the placement of the refugees, uh, then that might be 
but many of the refugees in Jordan, Jordan has received, I mean, uh, they, and they continue to receive. Um, the, there's the infamous Zatari refugee camp that's very well known there. Um, but many of their refugees, for example, are from the Darab province. And then you have in Turkey, you have many of the refugees are from the Idlib province. So people go to the, to the, the neighboring country that's closest to their province. So yes, in, in some cases, Turkey has really uh, been able to step up the aid, um, and part of that is is that they have organizations there. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to meet one of these people over here who heads one of these organizations that's helping Syrian refugees in Turkey, and he said, we consider them our, our guests. They're really, uh, we're trying to take care of them as if they're our guests. But the reality is that whether it be Turkey, whether it be Jordan, whether it be Iraq, whether it be Lebanon also, that's another country that's taken in refugees. Uh, yes, uh, there, have been, there has been mismanagement of the funding being received for some of the refugees. At the same time, uh, you have to realize that some of these countries also have a large poor population to be with. And so to, to take in this amount of people, and not only take them in, it's not just about land mass, it's about, well, how do we take care of these people? How do we spend this money in the best way for them? How do we provide food and medical care uh, for these people? Um, and so, yes, uh, somebody had written the refu Jordanian refugee camps. I mean, people tend to try to avoid them if they have Syria. Uh, Turkey is, is, you know, would be the, the optimal place to go. Um, just, uh, and, just to point uh, out, I'm um, sorry. Go ahead, Malak. I'll, I'll continue after you. Go ahead. Um, so uh, the other thing I wanted to mention that on the ground in Turkey, there are, are uh, quite a number of organizations that are working. So, yes, uh, the United Nations is providing some of the funding, but the, the trickiness of that is that some of the refugee camps in Turkey, for example, are actually right inside the Syrian border. And so getting funding there or getting aid there uh, is kind of, it may be problematic. Um, so that's part of the problem. Uh, the, uh, the thing in Turkey also that they have organizations such as something called Wotan. And this organization has branches across the Middle East. It, it opened uh, shortly after the, the revolution started. And for example, they're taking care of, they have different branches and they're taking care of refugees from these branches. But again, it becomes a lot easier to do that when the camps are actually outside of the Syrian border. When they're inside of the Syrian border, then there, there are questions about, well, who's responsible? How are we going to get large trucks of aid in? Um, who, who will be distributing the aid? How do we keep track of this aid once, I, once it's actually inside? And there's one more thing I want to say. Um, we're focusing a lot of our talk here on refugee camps. But let's not forget 6.5 million people who are inside. So they say that, uh, statistics say that people in the refugee camps, about 20 percent of them are in strong need of aid. The estimate is that about 80 percent of people inside are in strong need. And so that's a lot of people, which aid is not getting to. So the refugee camps may be bad, but the people inside are suffering much, much more because it's, you know, People who have brought aid inside of Syria have been shot at, have been shelled. Um, it's it's a whole other ball game to get aid to people inside, and so there, this is uh, uh, I guess a multi-level carrying crisis if you want to. Um, yes, uh, I'd like to just I'd like to expand on your ideas. It is very true. Um, you know. Um, you know, comparing the size from Syrian and refugee camps, refugee camps luckier, you know, they're away from the regime, you know, they're, they're being taken care of as much as the resources are scarce, but at least, you know, unfortunately the people living in Syria itself are the ones that are, you know, going through many hardships every single day and have very, very lack of resources because, again, the government is monitoring everything that's entering there and is making it very difficult to make access for these uh, civilians every single day. Now, I want to talk briefly, my uh, to discuss about the medical basis in terms of hospitals and what what exactly is there for these patients to, to make it alive, you know, and be healed. Uh, I want to discuss first of all and talk about the medical relief and 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 it's basically continued to be a challenge in Syria, in Syria and in refugee camps. So this is both of them that I will be discussing for my topic. 
Um, there are private, and there's also there's private, and there's also uh, government hospitals. Now, unfortunately, the government hospitals are not a great tax, or not a great location to be, you know, to be taken care of because the government bases um, are not. They're very expensive, especially that a lot of these civilians that are being bombed from their homes or, you know, being, you know, uh, ill, it, this procedures can be very expensive being taken care of at a government hospital. And to add on to, these civilians are not in very good hands. It was reported that many civilians that were taken care of in the hospital by a government hospital were either tortured, um, they were careless, they, they took advantage of their bodies to do other certain things, and yes, did all of us freeze or just Nada? Yeah. No. No, Nada didn't freeze right now. Can you hear me? Nada didn't freeze. You guys have to put this on your headphones, you guys. If you have a headphone. Yeah, I know. It is. I have it on the post. If Malak, you want to plug in a headphone real quick. Sorry. It, Malak, Malak um, do you want to plug in a headphone? Yes. No, you froze for a moment. You're fine. Oh, so that you're fine. Go ahead. Max says we're good. You can hear us. All right. So as I as I was continuing my topic about because we're echoing. I need to put headphones in the back on. Yeah. Because it's echoing. Um, they're actually not. Okay, you guys go ahead. Okay. We can give um, you a minute. It's fine. All right. I, I just wanted to real quick touch yeah, based upon the, um, what you were saying, how, like, uh, you and Malak, are you saying that 80% of the people living in Syria, they're way worse than refugee camps? You know, that is true, but then at the same time, you know, people are moving to their refugee camps. It's not easy. You're leaving your home. You're leaving your, your, your place that you've lived in all your life, and you're going to a, like, a desert, a place that's stranded. It's like you're on a stranded island, they say. So that's very hard and difficult, and there's there's things involved, like only 40% of the camps have electricity. I know that as well as if you go into the city, not electricity goes on and off, but I feel like it's different living on a strand in a place like a desert. It's Things are very limited there. Um, like Also, for example, each every 50 refugees get one lantern, like that's, that's very hard to even imagine. So they lack essential necessities, like even blankets, um, especially during the time of year, people who live maybe inside of Syria right now, they do have these basic necessities because they're living in their homes right now. They, these people in refugee camps left their homes. They don't have that anymore. So as well as the sand, people may not realize it, but the sand also takes a huge part in the refugee camps. Sand gets into these young kids' eyes, um, into their nails, into their hairs, their eyebrows their eyelashes, and this causes redness in the eyes, it causes skin irritations. It gets to that point, and sand can cause all of that, so people people get sick from things, especially young kids get sick from things like that. And also, um, bath, bathroom-wise, they, they, they don't have a toilet, so they have to dig a hole, and this hole, many, many, one refugee camp uses that same hole, so, you know, you can imagine, like, how, how that goes. Um, if you guys can let well, because I was cut off and there was a freeze on my uh, my part. Um, I was discussing uh, briefly on uh, private versus uh, government hospitals and the medical aspect in Syria and the refugee camps. Um, like I discussed just briefly about the government hospitals that unfortunately are very dependent on because they don't take very good care of their civilians. On top of that, they're torturing their they're coming, they won't make it alive, and so they're taking advantage of many bodies in, uh, as civilians. Um, in terms of the private aspect of hospitals in Syria, um, they're targeted by the Syrian government, uh, the regime specifically. The government is monitoring these hospitals, and they don't want them to be strong and move on. They're bombing the hospitals, they're kidnapping people, they're killing injured civilians before they make it to the hospital, and this is causing a very low decrease in the private hospital. So, you trying to find a hospital, you can't any. Because, and, um, 
And uh, and then to add on, there's a lack of specialty doctors too. So you know, a lot of them have lost their lives. So although there are physicians, but we need specialty doctors for surgical procedures that happen. You know, that needs to be amputated, etc. And and sometimes even what's happening is because there's lack of doctors, there are students that are in school for pharmacy or nursing or for medical school are volunteering and are stepping in to help in private hospitals even if they don't have they haven't graduated from school but just step in that anything anything could help anyone wants to expand a little more sure um and so I think that one of the things that we're seeing, and, and this is what we were hoping to accomplish today, is one of the things that we're seeing is we're talking about this, this staggering humanitarian crisis um, and, and where Syria is headed. Uh, but one of the things that we often fail to do is offer, okay, so how can we help these people practically? Um, what are ways in which uh, we can help? And uh, I think one of the things that uh, you, you talked a little bit about the medical efforts. Um, the other efforts I'd like to talk about are education efforts. And there are a number of organizations which have banded together and are and are actually setting up schools, for example, in, in refugee camps. So uh, in Qaf refugee camp, we have an organization called Wotan, uh, which has a branch called uh, Generation Freedom. And they've set up a school inside of the refugee camp, and they have over 600 students. Um, but when you talk to some of these students, you get to hear their stories, and so you ask them, well, how long has it been since you were last in school? And some of them will say two years. Um, so one of the little girls, I was asking her, so what do you do in your time? Uh, and she said, oh, I, I help take care of my, my um, nieces and nephews. And I said, okay, so what else do you like to do? And she really did, she kind of looked at me like, well, I don't, you know, she's, she's about 11, 12, but what else is there for her to do? She said, nothing, I just, I help my family. And so I asked her, well, what kind of books do you like to read? And she looked at me like, well, you know, where on earth are you from? Where am I supposed to get books? And so even access to uh, things like that, which you have this population of children who are just sitting there doing nothing, nothing for them to do and don't have access to uh, anything that would, uh, you know, help them think forward or think about changing their situation. So schools like the one set up by Generation Freedom and Clock Refugee Camp is very important. Um, there are also schools being set up inside. Unfortunately, those often become regime targets. And the other problem is that uh, a lot of the schools, the actual buildings have been destroyed. And so you have a problem of the school buildings being destroyed and then all the books being gone. And so, you, and then you have teachers who have fled as well with their families. So it's a, it's a number of things, but there are, I mean, I'm going to put this website right here. This organization in particular, I saw the work that they're doing. Um, the Syrian American Council is working closely with, uh, with such organizations on the ground um, to try to get the resources that they need uh, also. Um, and so that's another site you can visit if you want to learn more about how you can actually help. And so the important thing is, yes, yes we need to talk about it, we need to be aware there, but what are the things that we can do from so far away? And so, it, for example, in terms of education, if you're really interested in, in, in helping, there are ways to organize, uh, for example, book drives and then trying to find a way to get them to keep by working with one of these organizations. Um, these are the types of things that we can do while we are far away in the States. Um, I think um, the lock froze just a little. There's a delay. No, okay. I, she's going to freeze I'm, on the I'm done. <laughs> um, okay. um, so I, I just wanted to uh, speak about, uh, what is it called? Um, oh, by another, the way, I just want to speak here. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Uh, oh. Nada had mentioned that children are having to learn a new language. Um, in Reh Rehanli, Turkey, there are actually schools that have been set up and are following the Syrian curriculum, and so they are Arabic. Um, so it depends on the area of Turkey that you're in. In Rehaniye, or Rehanli as they call it in Turkish, uh, there are schools which are Arabic curriculum, and so they have been set up by an organization like Watan or another one like, um, I forgot the name, I think the school is called Dar es Salaam. 
Uh, so there, there is access to Arabic education, but again, their resources are extremely limited Minimum. because exactly. you have kids whose parents want to put them in school as quickly as possible. And so you have a large, yeah. yeah. Well, I think, well, I think, um, Malak, to just to say real quick is, you know, yes, there might be um, some schools that provide the Arab Arabic curriculum, which is a little more convenient for children children that have learned Arabic, speak fluent Arabic, you know, and are Syrians, but, you know, looking at it this way, if it's learning a new Turkish language or sticking to the normal Arab Arabic uh, language, they the, the parents definitely want their children to get educated, so they will do any sacrifice if it's learning a new language or just going to a school that provides the Arabic curriculum, so you make a good point. Um, also, you guys are talking about, um, you ladies are talking about education, but some, uh, what's happening now in refugee camps, it, it reached the point where even schools have been transformed into refugee centers. Um, for example, um, in Lebanon, there's these two towns called Wadi Khalid and Musta Hamoud, both uh, refugee camps in Lebanon. Um, uh, they've changed, they've changed the, the schools into, they've changed the, uh, the schools into refugee camps because they're, they don't know what to do with these uh, refugees because they keep on increasing every single day. So that's why you're seeing a lack of education. And um, and then from there, they need food for their children. Uh, the mothers need food for their for their children, or they just need basic necessities, such as a cooking stove for just making bread or some type of soup, and they don't even have that, so have that to do. And uh, it's come also to the point where um, not not a lot of aid is coming into Syria and the refugee camps, and families in the refugee camps have to um, marry their daughters to the landlords near the um, refugee centers just to make money out of that. So it's, it's very bad conditions right now. Um, you want to continue? Um, yes, I, I do want to talk about other options. So besides me speaking of, you know, the government hospitals and the private, which, you know, were a struggle to get civilians for um, special care or special surgical procedures, um, there is an organization that I, I am taking part of. It's called the Syrian Expatriates, which I will put the website in after I'm done talking about it. And these are basically, uh, they're special programs for subspecialty doctors because, again, um, I spoke about that, you know, there are lack of subspecialty doctors. There's just general physicians or people that haven't finished school, you know, medical school or nursing or pharmacy. And so we need people that, that have that experience, that know in severe conditions, they know how to take care of their patients. And with that, uh, the Syrian expatriates, uh, they, this organization first started off, 78% are doctors and they're well-educated people, well-rounded people that have a background in the medical field. And Syrian expatriates, specifically the medical aspect, it focuses on medical care and sending uh, doctors in de designated underserved areas that are in desperate need. If it's in refugee camps in Turkey, in Jordan, in Iraq, or in Syria itself. So there are many locations. Um, with that, how did they make this happen? They use manpower, they tried locating a workplace, and they tried as much as possible to make it, make it possible to get medical equipment. And um, I just want to stress about medical equipment as much as, as, you know, country, as people support or fund money for medical equipment. Again, we're serving a country. It's always going to be scarce. We're always going to be in minimum equipment or things or medical uh, medical things that, that will help serve patients. And for these locations, for these field hospitals and medical points specifically, um, they're not, they don't have a specific location. They're mobile. They're unstable because unfortunately the government is always um, targeting these areas and they're targeting these doctors and they're, they're tracking them down to make sure that the civilians are not given critical care to the patient. So it's very difficult. And it's uh, also to make another point, the patient access to medical locations are difficult because due to the bombarding and the checkpoints, um, where are these locations and where exactly are they in? They're in just normal houses. They're in basements. They're in dungeons. They're in cells. They're just in random locations. So they're not like a, a public uh, hospital. They're just in open homes that they find that they just, you know, designate areas and they just set up a few things that they have to serve the civilians. 
Also to add on, uh, um, where do they get these equipment, you may ask, is that they're purchasing them in Syria from local providers that will provide um, medical medications, you know, whatever they're in need. In terms of the other equipment, medical equipment, they're getting it from Turkey. Again, um, Turkey is doing an amazing job in funding anything that is needed to, to help serve their civilians and heal them from their wounds or their injuries or their procedures or surgeries. So that's another aspect if you guys want to add on. So... Mary, yeah, Mary brought up a really good point, which falls a little bit under the medical category, but also under the education category. And, and she asked, do you ladies think that children will recover from the emotional scars of the suffering they're enduring? And the, the, the reality is that you have children um, whose families are all emotionally scarred. So it's not only the children, the whole family. Once you become a refugee or a displaced person, or even just live inside of Syria, um, you're exposed to a lot of things that a normal child wouldn't be, whether it be seeing bodies in the street, whether it be having your, your friends killed, um, whether it be seeing your father dragged off or your mother, uh, and, and this has happened and this, there's documented evidence, or your mother right in front of you. Um, mm -hmm. Those things, are, those have become the reality of serious children. And I don't know if they will recover from those emotional scars. Um, yes, it takes time, but also it takes the resources to address these psychological scars. And oftentimes, that's at the bottom of the list. I mean, and, and education is sometimes also at the bottom of the list. When you don't have food and water, and you don't have a place to stay, those things get pushed to the back burner. And so if, and, and that's why I'm really, I, I came back from Turkey very passionate about education for these children. And the reason I'm passionate about that is because if the education issue is not addressed, then you you just compile these these emotional scars that that much more. And the one of the things that I noticed is that when you would see the children at the refugee camps, um, they would start flashing the peace signs immediately. Um, they would start talking, uh, you know, singing these revolutionary songs. So they never have a chance to get away from this environment. Once you're a refugee and you, you're, you're branded as a Syrian refugee, these kids' environment is always, you know, how, how is Bashar going to leave? They're hearing the stories from their friends. They're hearing the stories from other families at the refugee camps. They have no escape from this reality. And so I don't know uh, if they will ever, ever recover. Um, you know, I remember one of the girls at the refugee camps, my friend told me, she asked her, well, who are your friends? And she said, um, all of my friends are dead. And she, she said it with such, just like it was a normal thing. And this is a 10, 11 year old child. That is not a normal thing, but it has become normal for them. It has become their reality. And so, and they have no escape from it for as long as they're out of their country. Um, and they're just sitting with nothing, um, productive to do. This will remain their reality. And so again, I stress the importance of you know, supporting initiatives like Generation Freedom, which are, or through Wolfpack, which are providing these education initiatives, um, and they're, they've, they've done training for their teachers, they continue to do training. One of the teachers that I talked to said another problem that they have is that um, with, with the children being out of school for two years and already coming a lot of times from a very poor background, um, education is not a high, is not high on their list of priorities. And so it's also helping these children realize that education will help move your country forward in the future and the importance of that. And then on the other hand, you have these little girls who would ask them, what do you want to be? Well, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a teacher. And so they, they do have hopes and aspirations, but it's a matter of how, how do you, how do you, you know, allow them to realize those hopes and aspirations with such little resources. Um, um, so I want to mention um, um, about the resources in the, specifically in the refugee camps. Although these Syrian refugees are lacking food, they're lack, elect, lacking electricity, um, plumbing and freezing plumbing systems and freezing weather conditions when it rains, especially during this time of the year. But most of all, they have lost their dignity and their privacy. It's their privacy and it's gotten to the point where they they don't people they feel like they're not treated as humans anymore. So ways we can help for these refugees in borders of Syria as well inside Syria itself 
is just to be just the presence of humanitarian organizations on the ground is important as a sign of a Western support. As Manak mentioned, she was just in Turkey, and it was nice. It was nice going there because you, you see it with your own eyes. It's different when you see it with your yourself rather than seeing it on news networks or media or the TV or hearing it on the radio. It's different when you see it yourself. You have your personal input on it. And when you go back to the states or country, wherever that person lives, you get to expand more on it and spread awareness for others to to learn because about because some people don't even know what's going on in Syria. And also um, another point I want to mention is more than just sending medical equipment or technical advice or just resources, uh, we need we need funding funding for media companies who help to spread through television, radio networks in Syria. So these will help, these fundings will help these media networks create a forum for discussion and help us end the violence against these civilians. I feel like that is actually the essential part right, currently right now because if we do that, that is spreading awareness not just only to states, to the world to know, to know about what's going on in Syria. By doing that, we'll have, we'll have the world helping us and aiding us into build build a better Syria and for it to be free. Um, I, I just want to expand a little more on your ideas, Malak and Lama. Lama. Um, you guys made a few good points. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting because these these kids, I hear stories from friends that have actually went to these refugee camps in Turkey and in Jordan, and they tell me, like, they learn to appreciate the small things, like, the small things that they find in the streets to play with, the small things that they can just uh, make a game with because they have nothing to do. You know, they, they've learned that this is their reality for a couple of years or, or if this is ever going to end, so they're unfortunate. You know, and education, I feel, is a very big aspect for children because it keeps them a little busy. It keeps them occupied to do something else. It, it keeps them to look forward, to move forward, to say, when I grow up, I want to be a doctor. When I grow up, I want to be a nurse. When I grow up, I want to make a difference. And that itself is a big difference because they can move on and, you know, make uh, Syria a better future. And also Actually, to add on what Nema said... Um, about education, the, sorry for interrupting, but um, uh, currently uh, um, in Chicago they have this what's called um, Illinois um, Institute of Technology. Um, they have this, okay. uh, this branch called the um, Jesuit branch, and this is basically taking young college students, college students in Syria that are that are eager to learn and finish their college education to go to this university um, and help them and help and help them go to this university and they actually live there they live on campus I've met with a, a couple of people that I know that have that are currently in the school they love it and they're happy to be there because it's impossible for them to study in Syria because they never know if they're gonna come back home dead or alive so, so Lema, Lema, is this, a better place Lema, just to clarify is a school in Chicago and they're bringing Syrian yeah. civilians to Chicago to educate them yeah correct that's great. And actually, it, does this apply with the IIT um, um, University? Yeah, it's if called Jizur. It's called uh, Jizur. Okay, right. Right, this program is amazing, and I've heard about it. I actually met a person myself when I went to visit the campus, and his experience was phenomenal. He said that, you know, uh, 